This episode of the Planning Podcast is one for the books. We have the CEO of Silent Work, John Barnes. We are going to talk about the future of college basketball and also the strategies around mindfulness. Make sure you subscribe, stay tuned, and of course, stay planning. All right, all right. John Barnes, JB, what's up, my brother? Life is good, brother. How you doing? Man, we good. Sometimes they say you got to do it one time. Sometimes they say you got to do it two times. And I think two times works for us on this go round. That works. Brother, so. that works. <laughs> All right, let's do this. So Mr. Silent Work, trainer and owner, John Barnes is form is the former 2007 Mr. Northwest Florida in the good old Gulf Coast. Now, as you guys know, I say 850 all the time, hashtag 850 for Walton Beach. This is one of the uh, icons uh, uh, throughout the panhandle. And so those that know JB, if you got a fast break and he's on defense, watch your backboard. All right, so... He, he gained experience playing at every level, D1, D2, and D3, but of, of course playing overseas as well in, in Valencia, Spain. Uh, his daily grind is essentially being an athlete. He's been able to not only work on developing his skills to be more innovative with his clients, but also identify ways to be a, a, an agent of change within his community. John Barnes, CEO of Silent Work, thanks for joining us today, brother. Excited about our, our conversation. Man, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh. Of course, of course. Hey, let's jump in. So you rock in silent work. I see the T. I got me some T-shirts, of course, <laughs> and make sure y'all y'all support. Uh, rock in silent work, it means something different to everyone, I would assume. Sure. What does silent work mean to you? So silent work means to me the the work of the intangibles that um that are a little bit behind the scenes, like your focus, your clarity, your uh, how you deal with stress, like these things that are that we're that are happening to us daily, whether we know them or not. Um, but the work into them, like the work to improve them, can't be vocalized, right? Like there's something there's like it's it's a behind the scenes skill that nobody can see. So. I, you know, that's that's what sign work means to me of, of putting in the work on those those different intangibles. Mm. Now. One of the aspects of silent work that I find very intriguing about your process and you typically don't see this in sports or you don't see it being talked about enough within sports, which is really mindfulness. Right. What is it that you're thinking about? How have you incorporated the mindfulness techniques techniques with the athletes that you train? Because you train athletes from middle school all the way up to collegiate and also professional athletes as well, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah, I mean, the mindfulness is, is just um, because I, I feel like that's the, the start of any skill, right? Like um, there has to be a certain clarity as far as like what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it. Um, and being able to be aware of your thoughts is the the starting point of your mindfulness. Um, so that's something that I, I I try to jump into immediately, right? Like, you know, you you hear me talk about that quite often in my sessions of like, hey, what you think about? Tell me your last three thoughts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because I can see it, like in your body language, like it shows. Are you missing shots? And are you dropping your head? Is there like you sucking your teeth? Like, I know that's the mm. negative thought that just went on, right? So mm. the, the quicker we can be aware of those thoughts and get them under control, the faster we can get through and, and really hone in that skill. That's strong. You And you said something very, very powerful. It's not only the awareness of your thoughts, it's your ability to control your thoughts, right? So the first phase of that is, and I've heard you say it this way, think about what you're thinking about. Right. Yeah. What is it that you're thinking about? And then once you get that assessment, once you get that audit, all right, how do we make some adjustments to control what you're thinking about that fulfills your overall objective? If it's 
Lays. <laughs> if it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know me, JB, Marcus, you know, those that know me, I am the king of air basketball. If you see me walk down the hallway, I'm giving you something, you know. Now, ball in hand, it's a little different. I'm just going to bounce it to them and let them display what I was thinking, right? Uh, but but ultimately, it's that, it's that power of thought. So we'll, we have so much that we can unpack on silent work. We'll be covering silent work as you grow and develop and evolve and, and continue to impact um, clients all across the country, all across the globe. Um, part of what I wanted to make sure we discussed today was, I, I would say, one of the newer developments uh, that we've been, been able to see, which is overtime, right? So uh, this overtime announcement, and I'm going I'm to share just a, a few, few points of this overtime announcement. So ultimately, they will be starting a professional basketball league that will offer high school basketball players an alternative to college in preparation for the NBA. Overtime Elite will begin in September of 2021. So in a few months, now it's, it's, it's right around it's the corner. It's here. <laughs> right. It will feature 30 of the nation's top prospects from ages 16 to 18. And then as well, these athletes will be guaranteed a minimum salary of $100,000 in addition to bonuses and equity in the league. So... All right, let me. I'm not done. The leagues, <laughs> the leagues athletes will also have access to healthcare, disability benefits. Uh, if they choose not to uh, pursue an NBA career, the league will pay them up to hundred thousand dollars to go towards their college tuition. Now, players that participate in overtime elite will forfeit their eligibility to play high school or college basketball if they join the league. Okay, John Barnes, CEO of Silent Work trainer extraordinaire when it pertains to basketball and so much more. Now, you've played college ball. What? Let me take a step back. If your son was chosen as one of the top 30 to play within this league, and also knowing your collegiate experience, what would be some of your feedback, some of your concerns, and as well comments? Um. So I think it would be really interesting. So my first thought would be if they're willing to pay a 16-year-old a $100,000 salary, how much can we really generate? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, you're going to give a 16-year-old a $100,000 salary? Like, most adults aren't getting that. So I'm thinking, like, <laughs> that's where my mind goes. Well, what can I really get, right? <laughs> so... I think I'm exploring that option. I'm going to check it out, right? Because I'm confident in what I could do. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're really giving it to the parents you, of the athlete. Mm -hmm. You're not giving it to the kid, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm confident in what I can do with that, right? Um, so I'm definitely inter entertaining it for sure. Okay. So we have... And let's let's do this as we talk about this space of athletes getting paid, high school collegiate athletes. Yeah, you know, we were talking about. Um, I know we talking about basketball, but we're gonna shout out Lavar Ball, you know, in this right. in this space, you know, with him um, really being offensive with this strategy and saying that this is how this needs to operate moving forward. Um, I think time will tell on his impact you know, when it pertains to the overall industry of collegiate sports and also professional sports, basketball specific. Um, but as we look at this proposal, so that, that's a very interesting point. You said, all right, if you willing to give a 16-year-old $100,000, what is the, you know, how much money are you making, you know, sir and ma'am, right? Um, and then what other options do I have to generate that type of income if it's not through this league, but through another prism? Now, one of the things that I saw through overtime, which was interesting, is that they've been around for a while, right? Like, they got a strong following. A lot of the, the younger athletes see that, hey, I'm trying to get on these on these highlights. I'm trying to get on House of Highlights. I'm trying to get on overtime. Like, I'm finna, sure. here, here's my air basketball. Bing, bing. I'm finna give somebody some of that work and, yeah. and see if I can get, get on a highlight. So, is the, I'm curious about their market capture. Right. Like the 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 way in which we consume sports is different. Usually it used to be, hey, don't put a TV in your kid's room. 
And if they got a phone, you ain't really got to worry about that. You know, like it, it that that defeats it. So right. seeing how much the the um, the market is influencing, I feel like some of overtime's decision. Do you feel like the kids or these student athletes are equipped enough to know how to say yes or no to a, a um, an opportunity like this? Um, do I think the kids are equipped enough? No, right? Like you know, I think they're just taking. They they would take whatever you gave them. You know what I mean? But I think the the adults in the background or whoever is managing that should be able to, and, and, and they're probably already well aware. Like I'll use an example of a kid who would pro- who would be in that league if he if if this was a year later. So Mikey Williams, right? Okay. Mikey Williams has two point nine million followers on Instagram. Mm. I don't know what it looks like outside of uh on his other platforms, but on Instagram, two point nine. He also has his own show on Overtime, right? So I'm sure he's very aware. I'm sure his parents are very aware of what they can capture through his audience. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so I think Overtime isn't it? like it's it's pretty smart because they've been watching as it's grown, as the social media thing has grown. They've been watching kids be able to. Um, grow audiences through their highlights. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, Mikey or whoever goes down the lane and dunks on somebody, right? And it's posted on overtime and it gets 100, 200, 300,000 views and Mikey just gained 5,000 followers. They like, hold on. (laughs) Yep. You know what I mean? And right. so I think they're very aware, and I think it's it's pretty genius, and and it's it's the closest thing to a win win as a whole in, in the whole basketball structure for youth, right? Like mm-hmm. usually that's just the the athlete, and then somebody else is winning. Yeah. Overtime yeah. is 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 providing something where at least let me win something too. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That and and I think that is the um, argument for athletes to get paid, right? Like typically it is the athlete that drives uh, fans to the stadium. Um, It is the athlete that, uh, um, or the athletes that get the media contract. Like everything is is driven off of the athlete being able to perform. And the way in which it's been set up historically, not saying that it's wrong, but it, it is not definitely inclusive, is that the athlete is the one performing but those getting paid are the administrators, it's the coaches, right? Like, hold on, everybody getting increases, but how do how do we ensure that those that help cook the pie can participate in the slices as well, right? And so it's just like helping bake a pie. You've seen everybody over there eating it and they got ice cream. Like, man, yeah. must be, you know, so, um, all right. So let, now let's think about college ball. So one thing about the collegiate experience, there's a lot of um, value that is <laughs> honest, to be honest, that is uh, that athletes are learning to extract out of college. Right. Because typically the value is this is a vehicle to get me to the league, mm-hmm. not necessarily everything around the vehicle, the relationships that you're able to establish with those that you go to class with, the uh, some of the skill sets that you're able to either refine or uncover. Um, so if you are foregoing that experience, how are colleges going to make themselves relevant right now? We know it's the top 30 athletes, but those 30 athletes got some brand control, right? They have some influence as well that will ultimately feed into the college's ability for them to make money. So how do they compete? Does this put pressure on them? What are your thoughts in regards to just the overall college uh, basketball arena? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely puts pressure on them, as it, as it should, because, yeah. you know, you look at this year, it was the first year the G League started taking high school guys, right? So mm. now the NCAA is filling it on both sides, right? The, the NBA said, hey, we got something for you. And now these high school the overtime is, is providing something to the younger guys. Um, so it's definitely putting pressure on them, as it should, because the – and I don't want – I don't want to act like I'm just like super hard on college, but like, you know, these guys are, like you said, increasing salaries and values of schools. Um, 
And if they do take money, they get penalized for it. Right. Like you see that with James Wiseman last year. Right. So from where, you know, he he attended a high school or a college from his high school coach, which is Penny Hardaway. Right. Penny, when he was in high school, you know, helped his family with whatever. I don't know the details of what he helped with, but then he gets penalized when he goes to college. Mm. Well, mm. hold on now. I'm a wow. number one draft pick. I'm going to be a number one draft pick. You know what I mean? And it's just like, you're going to take half my season from me? It's just not, there's no win-win with the NCAA. They just want to win, right? Like, yes, there's a platform, but you're starting to see it more and more. Even when Zion blew that shoe out, I think yeah. everybody held their breath when they saw that, like, uh-oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We know he's going number one. <laughs> what, if he, what if he rolls an ankle, where he breaks an ankle in that moment? Why am I here? You know what I mean? What am I getting from this? And so there has to be something to like leverage the playing field. Like at least make me feel good about being here. You know what I mean? It's not like, and it's just a one avenue. So I'm I'm open for, you know, guys being able to um, have their own thing, their own brand, and being able to have more than one avenue to the NBA. Yeah, I think it's just yeah. something to get better for everyone. That's good, and 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 the the way the NCAA has been set up within all the different intercollegiate sports, basketball, football, um, and as you mentioned, we're, we are not beating up the coaches, right? Like we're not beating up the administrators. We're not saying that at all. We're just saying that in, the term in, in inclusive is just absent from this overall equation, um, especially from those that are exemplifying the uh, uh, the work. Um, you know, every economist, if they assess just the NCAA in which amateurism has played a role in um, the overall revenue generating activities, you know, it's not it's not friendly words that describe what's going on right now. And so uh, we, we are definitely acknowledging the gap um, and seeing this as a solution. Right. As you mentioned, to open up different avenues. Um, OK. All right. So let's let's do this. Let's do this, JB. You, you, you I'm going off off script here. So you agree that college athletes should get paid. Yeah, no and yes, right? Okay. I think that they should be able to get paid if they can market up something on their own, right? Like, if I come in as Zion and I have a following, why can't I go and do an appearance and get paid for it? Okay, okay. Well, that takes away of, like, any anybody feeling like, oh, he's getting more than the next person and this and that. Well, he did that on his own. That's him. Okay. Right? okay. So I think there should be at least at least an opportunity to go and make money if I can. Okay. 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 I think this name, image, and likeness policy that is, um, you know, revealing it, itself and, and actualizing itself, like this is something new, so we're all going to, you know, see how this all impacts the overall industry. You know, and I the the way in which I I originally thought about the name, image, and likeness were those that already have a following, as you mentioned. And for football, it may be the Trevor Lawrence. You know, it may be you know these collegiate players that already you know they take their helmet off. You already know who that is, right? Um, and with a strong following, to where they may have some uh, marketing opportunities. We see it through Instagram. This was sponsored by Energy. So there may be a few revenue generating opportunities there. Um, but one of the areas that I didn't think about that I'm that I'm starting to become more interested in, but also I, I see this happening um, probably more frequent than, than what's being discussed are those athletes that may, you know, it may be uh, a second string linebacker and uh, the sixth man on the basketball team that go start a trucking company. They don't watch the YouTube series on an entrepreneur talked to their uncle was able to use their their uh um I almost said stimulus check they were able to use their uh their refund right through through 
uh, what is it called? You know what I'm talking about. That money you get through school if your parents only make so much money. Pell, Pell Grant. Pell Grant. You're able to use your Pell Grant, leverage your Pell Grant to get the LL. So there's that aspect of it to where those that would not have the ability to be as creative on generating revenue now have that space to not be penalized for it, right? Because unfortunately, even within the, I forget the the young man's name, but his YouTube channel, I believe is called Destroying, right? And he's a punter and he was making money off of his YouTube, um, his channel and the university said, hey, you have to stop this. And he actually chose to keep going. And ironically enough, he's still getting NFL tryouts. And so this this level, this way, this this medium of compensation has definitely been um, a topic that uh, uh, of conversation. Now that that name, image, and likeness policy is starting to reveal itself, and, and California was the first to jump it off. I really think that um, some of the intangibles you mentioned that needs to be around the athlete. Um, to ensure that, you know, again, you're putting a check to a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, an 18-year-old. What comes with them, right? Like, what environment are they coming from? What about their families? You know, we we all know that even within all sports, all industries, I can't tell you a situation where an athlete hasn't gotten paid, right? Like, folks being getting paid, you just don't know about it. Right. So, uh, um, so I think with this space, this, this specifically overtime elite, it has a lot of opportunity. What would you say from your vantage point, dealing with athletes, seeing the different backgrounds they come from, what would you say was, should be a non-negotiable? Let's say your child is selected. Let's say, you know, you said, all right, we do have other options, but I actually like this aspect of overtime elite because they provide X, Y, and Z for the athletes as well. What would you say would be a non-negotiable that they should implement knowing that they are working with um, student athletes in, in the range of 16, 18? I mean, I think like if you're going to have them playing games and participating, I think the healthcare is huge, right? Like think about parents who can't afford that, right? So if we're going to participate in this league, at least be able to take care of my kid, right? Yeah. And be able to have them, if something, God forbid, were to happen, we can take care of it, right? Like right. it's not it's not the end, you know right. what I mean? I think that's you know, non-negotiable. The money obviously is non-negotiable. If we're going to, because it, cause it, it'll start to get slippery um, as far as like, how many games are we playing now, right? Like, is this season a little long, right? Like, are we putting a lot of stress on the, on a 16-year-old body, right? Like, I think those are all aspects that we really have to pay attention to and, and they have to be watched with a fine line because you don't want to get to where it's too much. And you're just kind of you're generating all this money through these this league of young kids and you're wearing them down. Right. And so now they're 25 and, you know, stuff is going out because there's, there's been such a high um, output on their body. Um, yeah. so those things, I think, as long as as long as if I can take care of myself as a whole, I think that's the non-negotiable health wise and financially. Okay. 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 So one of the, um, so the health is definitely important. I know for myself, I had some broken bones in my foot and it wasn't until my health insurance expired is when I tried to get it situated. And now I got to come out of pocket. Right. And so that, that is a valid, valid concern. When we think about the phases, so you have a 16 year old, let's say he plays a couple of years, Mm -hmm. does well. Makes a couple hundred thousand. Now, if y'all know me, I'm not going to be on this planning podcast and not talk about financial literacy, financial wellness. Them, hey, we we have to immerse those young men with the information that they'll need to not to apply it, but to understand it first. Right. I think to your point with them being in between the ages of 16 and 18, that there should be a governing entity for all 30 athletes that has a game plan on their money and how it's dispersed, how much is saved, what's put into a trust fund, defensive planning, offensive planning, getting all that in place. It also says that they may have equity in the league. I want clarity on that as well. I also want some of those, you know, I want the media company as well. So if y'all listening, yeah, include that in your contract. Um but we have this timeline, 16, two years they play, 100,000. Then let's say they make it to the league, right? So you've gone this process, no high school, probably partial high school, 
no college. So your natural. So my this is my concern, JB. My biggest concern is the environment. I would want every player. So if it's 30 players, I would want every player to have a former NBA player as like they talking at least three days a week. Right. They need some type of male figure to help them talk through, think through the things they would experience if they didn't go through this process. Because this is new, it's unique, and you have, it's a new community. But if we look at the top 30 athletes, I'm pretty sure half of them going to have, their family is going to be income less than $50,000 a year, right? And so, you know, what type of resources do they have whenever they pick up the phone to speak to a loved one on concerns and, and, and issues. So I, I just, I would love to get your thoughts considering the, you know, you know, the role mindfulness environment and, and controlling what you think and what you're listening to, you know, the role that plays in regards of the last two free throws of the, of, of the game, right. And how that can have an impact considering the age, considering the amount of money they, they could potentially bring in, is this something that silent work could come in and say, hey, overtime elite, these 30 athletes, and to ensure that you get the full maximum potential, make sure you do X, Y, and Z when it comes to mindfulness, environment. Like, what would be your recommendations to them knowing that they have this opportunity with these, with these student athletes? Yeah, man, I think that that's huge because essentially you're going to be exposing them to a lot more they would naturally be if they just remain high school kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so what does that look like? I know for, I just finished watching um, Sierra Canyon, right? There, there's a, a, a high school out in California where LeBron James sons plays for, right? Okay, okay. These kids have, like in their season last year, they did a China tour to start the season, right? Throughout the season, they travel 40,000 miles, right? Going state to state. And I'm looking at it like, man, the amount of exposure, right? The, the, the amount of fandom that they're coming across. Yeah. I don't know if I can handle it at 16. Mm. I don't know. I don't know if I was ready for it. That's right? good. Like, I don't know if I could do it. Right, without a practice, without somebody grounding. That's good. That's a lot. That's even us as grown folks, you know, like even just the LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all the different platforms, communications. Now you have people criticizing you. Oh, how come you didn't do this? And they're 17. Right, right. And so think about LeBron James's son. Mm. And, And not only just him being on the team, not being in the starting five getting low minutes. Think about the type of mind you got to have to be stable in that space. That's a different, that's different, right? And the outsiders will look at it like he just LeBron's son and he just, everything is cushy and like everything is fluffy. And I'm like, no, nah, that takes a different kind of, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? A different kind of mindset to just be normal, to just walk around normal. Right, right. Right. Not not right. be not not perform at a high level to just be normal, just to take the criticism. Um, so the mindset, the 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 being aware of what you're thinking, what your thoughts are, like I think it's huge, man. Like it's having someone who can say, "Hey, I've been in this space." Right. Luckily for him, his dad was. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So he can he can be the person to uh, you know mentor that thought process, right, right? But all of them don't have that. Yeah, that's strong. We're gonna have to get Bronny to to write a curriculum because that that's an interesting piece that you touched on from you know LeBron and then Bronny himself. Just the navigation of it. Well, of course, as you guys know, we we are going to have to do a part two, three, and four uh, with John now before he leaves. We do have to get this. So as you can see here, if you are watching uh, through video, the planning podcast is spelt with a delta sign, P-L delta sign. In mathematics, the delta sign represents change. One thing that we've been able to identify here at IMC is that anything that changes significantly, the foundation of that is through planning. Can you share with our audience an example in which planning 
uh, resulted into uh, um, a great result? Yeah, I mean, my planning of my meditation practice, my mindfulness practice made my awareness go through the roof. Yeah. Right. Like I'm super aware of my emotions. I'm super aware of my thoughts and and how they affect me. Um, but that was intentional. That was a, a wake up with a plan on let's get that better today, every day. Um, and so without that, yeah, like I don't know where, you know, I, I feel like I, if you don't have that, you're just getting influenced and you don't really know where it's coming from. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So the planning of my, my meditation practice has has changed everything, just how I view the world. That's good. That's good. The bi- The biggest takeaway for me has been um, awareness, right? As you mentioned, making sure you're that you're aware of your thoughts and it's very parallel when it pertains to money. First step you got to take before you start growing your money is being aware where your money is going. And the, the second part of what you shared is, is what I'm most excited about is once you become aware, then you have to become, then you have to get control of your thoughts, right? Then you have to get control of your money. So that is the first step. So this has been good. As you guys know, we're going to keep unpacking this. John Barnes, you'll see him. He'll be a familiar face. Of, of course, Silent Work. Make sure you support the merch, silentwork.com. Check out our planning gear. I actually got one of my hats in today. Grab your hat at stayplanning.com. Hey, JB, appreciate you, brother. Blessings to you and the fam. And we hey, look forward to next next time we get you on the on the podcast, big dog. Man, thank you for having me on your platform, brother. Appreciate it. Yes, sir, OG. Bye.